the tuned circuit and switch on, you can see how regular the oscillations or waves that uh, it's transmitting are. Now, if I compare this uh, with the spark machine, you can see just how chaotic its radio waves are. Once the tune transmitter had been perfected, spark transmitters were quickly banned for polluting the airwaves. With the problem of interference solved, radio seemed so miraculous that it could be capable of almost anything. Early radios did still have one limitation. They couldn't transmit speech, only the simple pulses of Morse code. Morse code still used for messages on the shortwave band, and pulse codes are also used in, for radio-controlled models. I built this little car for a children's television series and I've hooked up the oscilloscope to the transmitter so you can actually see the stream of pulses that the car receives. Uh, if I work this switch, that's the one that works the headlights, you can see it just moves one pulse. If I shift that one, it works two pulses which actually opens the door. This one works the steering from left to right, you see it's moving four pulses. This one is shifting five pulses, and that's the speed control for forwards and backwards control, um, and so forth. Each, each series of pulses work a different function inside the car. To transmit speech and music instead of simple pulses, you first have to convert the sound to an electrical signal with a microphone, and then combine it with uh, the radio waves. In the radio receiver, it all gets separated out again. You can see this very clearly on an oscilloscope. If I turn on this little radio, then I now plug the oscilloscope in to the loudspeaker. Well, it's a bit, a bit large. This is giving a picture of the sound signal, and you can see it roughly matches the sound that's coming out of the loudspeaker. Now if I plug it in further back on the circuit, uh, this is the sound signal combined with the radio waves. You can see the peaks still roughly match the sound that it's making, and the radio waves are actually going rapidly up and down in the middle. Now if I stretch this out a bit, these are the actual radio waves, and you can see what's happening is that the sound is constantly changing their size or their amplitude. And that's why this is called amplitude modulation, or AM radio. The man who designed much of the practical circuitry for AM radio was an American called Edwin Howard Armstrong. While in France during World War I, he invented the superhet circuit, which has been used ever since. He then sold a patent to RCA back in America. I have an appointment to see Mr. Sarnoff. Oh, Mr. Sarnoff's expecting you, Mr. Armstrong. Thanks. You're welcome. He became a millionaire overnight and fell in love with the chairman's hey, secretary. Uh, how about you come for a spin in my motor? Okay. Pop in there. Oh, it sure is a big one. He bought a huge Hispano Suiza and climbed his tallest aerial to impress her. They were married soon afterwards. Will you marry me? Oh, Howard, my hero. The fundamental principles of radio have remained unchanged. This is the BBC transmitter at Brookmans Park, broadcasting medium wave radio to South East England. Inside, the engineers have restored the BBC's very first transmitter, built by the Marconi Company in about 1920. This end of it actually creates the radio waves, 
and this end of it combines them with the sound signal, the amplitude modulation. It's basically a series of giant tuned circuits with uh, the valves, the coils of wire of the inductors and uh, the overlapping metal plates of the capacitors. Well, this uh, generates about two kilowatts. This may sound a lot, but um, this modern transmitter is rated 150 kilowatts and it's all much more sophisticated. This one's actually broadcasting Radio 3 on AM all over southeast England. Inside, though, the basic components are still remarkably similar. The inductors have remained exactly the same, and the valves and capacitors, although they're now more enclosed, still work on the same principles as well. Transmitters like these broadcasting sound first appeared in World War I. They were used for sending messages by radio telephony. Broadcasting radio to entertain people was first started after the war by enthusiastic Marconi engineers. The BBC was then set up by the government in 1922 and listening to the radio rapidly became very popular. At first, most listeners had very simple receivers, crystal sets like the Rexophone. They needed enormous aerials because, like my radio at the start of the program, they had no battery and relied entirely on the energy of the radio waves in the air. It's easier to see how they worked on this homemade version. Instead of a coherer, it has a lump of crystal and a fine wire called the cat's whisker. Electricity will only flow one way through the contact between the wire and the crystal, and this has the effect of separating out the sound from the radio waves. Like the coherer, the theory behind the cat's whisker is very complicated, but it's quite simple to make it work. The imperfect contact between teeth and fillings can occasionally have the same effect, causing a few unfortunate people to hear the radio inside their head all the time. This is the modern equivalent of the cat's whisker, the germanium diode. If I put it under a magnifying glass, you can see it's an enclosed version of the same thing. You can see the whisker just touching the lump of germanium. The primitive radio I had at the beginning of the programme worked with one of these, and in fact, most modern transistor radios still use them as well. Much of the radio set's evolution has been preserved by Gerald Wells at the Vintage Wireless Museum. If you wanted something better than a crystal set, what sort of thing would you have had? Well, you could have had something like this, which is three separate units, hence it was called a wireless or radio set, because it was a set of parts. It would have consisted of a tune circuit, an RF amplifier, a detector stage and a power output stage. And that would have got you most of the local stations with earphones or a modest loudspeaker. What, what happened after that was the next stage? That well, the next the radio stage, they decided to stick it all in one box to make it less wires and to make it neater. And this was a bit more elaborate as well. More stations were coming onto the airwaves, so more elaborate tuning was needed. So they brought in a series parallel switching for your aerials and tuned circuits, variable condenser and reaction condenser, an RF stage to amplify the signal, detector stage to take the place of the old-fashioned cat's whisker and two stages of LF amplification. That would be quite an elaborate set, but you could, by moving these bars around, 